Hey everybody, thank you for watching episode six of SideQuest. We love doing these, and I wanted to quickly put this in as a shout out. Beetle and Grimm has a Kickstarter going through the end of November. If you are looking to get yourself a Pathfinder 2 character journal, they are $35, gorgeous, 150 to 200 pages, including all of the things that your class could need. The first four classes that are out right now are going to be the Fighter, Rogue, Cleric, and Wizard. But even more so, since they are sponsoring the show, we are doing a giveaway. December 1st, Episode 7 live show at 7.30 p.m. CST on Eric Frankhouse Presents. We're doing a raffle during that show. Come join us. Come watch. And if you want extra chances to win that raffle, use our stream loot cards. We have one Beetle and Grimm in there. It's the very first card in the list. Tons of chances for you to get entered in. We're super excited to be working with them as fans of tabletop gaming and fans of the quality of Beetle and Grimm. We couldn't be happier to have them as one of our sponsors. Now, on to episode six of Side Quests. Click boom. <laughs> Hey everybody, welcome back to SideQuest, episode 6. Uh, it has been a wild ride. Last episode, the live episode, episode 6, the Gorgon's Cave I affectionately named, yet we never, we never win the cave. So uh, today we're not going in the cave either. As a matter of fact, we're going to handle two weeks of the downtime as two of our players travel from uh, Merrifield back to... Maybe the first city we ever played in, in this setting, which is Eisenheim. So I'm going to take us over to everybody else. we got Voss and Everston here today. How are we doing, guys? Not too bad. Not yeah, too bad. We're so good. Are we all ready? Good. Are we all ready for, for going back home? Our home, our first city in this setting. I, 
I think that's right. Isn't that right, everybody? Isn't this the first city we've played in? It was, def- it was definitely the first city I played in. I know you guys had played a little bit in Nithontia before I came into the picture. Um, but uh, yeah, this was this was my first city, my first character in Nithontia. Malak, he was it. a wizard. He was a gunslinger. Who Al knows? It is the first one, right? Malak owns a, a gunsmith shop, actually. <laughs> Forgot about that. Who owns a gunsmith shop? Malik does. He started a gunsmith shop because he was a technomancer and he was he wielded a six gun. Although this was before Gunslinger came out for Pathfinder First Edition, so he was making and modding firearms. Do you remember? Well, we'll get to it. We'll get to it. Um, I, mean, I went deep into the notes for this, Drew. Deep into the notes. Oh. I told you I pulled everything out. Boy, uh, Todd, it was the first one we played in, right? When we started Athantia, wasn't Eisenheim the first city we played in as well? Is that the city we started building up? Then we that, added Kadra? That sounds right. Yeah. I'm pretty sure it is. So so for those who don't know, Eisenheim is this city that is on... You know, I'll explain it when we land. I'll explain the city when we land there for everybody. So let's start this off. Uh, we got a little bit of music going. Uh, I know this has a picture of the Whisper, but today... We are going to board one of the new ships from our Merrifield Town Hall meetings. We're going to be on the Flying Lyrist. Flying Lyrist is the third ship to join Merrifield, thanks to the citizens who watch the stream. Uh, It's a trade vessel with a small stage for music and performance. They sell tickets for entertainment. They also sell consumable items and trinkets. This is what they're known for. And the captain is a siren bard. Now... The Siren is going to be new for, I think, everyone watching the show. Uh, Those who have played, it is not. Sirens in this setting are when the tides uh, consume the world for the three years of darkness and all the oceans went away. This dark tides that rolled in, normally the creature, a siren, um, was what people believed caused captains like crash on rocks and do stuff. Like, like murder them, eat their... I mean, depending on what mythology you're looking at, horrible things happen. In this one, when the tides were falling, the sirens uh, led the captains of ships into the Never, which is the realm of the Fae. Uh, even though a lot of those ships did wreck, they saved those crew. While people lived there for those three years, kids were born. Between the sirens and the captains, usually, or maybe somebody else in the ship. Um... You know, myth mythology changes as it comes from one plane of existence to another. And the ancestry of Siren uh, came to be. They're very alien-looking to a point. They're tall, they're slender, uh, their skin has a glimmer to it. On close inspection, you can see they have tiny scales in the skin. Um, their eyes are black, solid, uh, from edge to edge. Uh, they're known for having very brightly colored um, hair and they have a voice that carries long distances and it's very soothing or menacing, depending on the kind of siren that you are. So the Siren Bard has a stage that they all perform on, which is pretty awesome. Um, and we will be starting the trip, leaving Merrifield from the air tower. And we're gonna do a quick kind of jaunt across. It's about a six day trip across the, the capital's island that it's on and all the way into the mountainous bluffs where Eisenheim will be. So, Drew, I know Voss wanted to do some crafting, you said, on the ship. I mean, yeah, if he can, uh, he won't have his workshop, so Well, there's one on the ship. Um, There are people people who do alchemy and trinkets. Um, So there is a crafting area. What type of crafting are you doing? Uh, It would be... Well, actually, I suppose it would matter whether or not because he needs he needs a soul for it because um, he would be doing a reliquary craft. Well, not really a reliquary craft, but he'd be doing the crafting of binding a soul. So, yeah, reliquary crafting. Um, okay. Because a couple of weeks ago, he picked up the um, blueprints for the wondrous figurine, the Onyx dog. Basically, he's going to make one oh. and then go back to go back to Gavin and be like, this is how you fucking do it, mate. See, no leakage is perfect. It works seamlessly. Like, that's, that's kind of his plan. Um, okay, okay. So uh, so that's what he was going to do. But 
um, if they were moving, he wasn't sure he was going to have time. But if they do have a workshop on the ship and he can mm-hmm. make use of it, then well, he'll absolutely now do that's it. a different question. Can you make use of course it is. Uh, so when you board the ship, the ship is gilded in uh, gold and glass. There are, there are very ornate, uh, almost elven-like qualities to the way this place is manicured. Um, mm-hmm. There's filigree everywhere. The doors that go in and out of the captain's quarters have got like this golden embossed leaves on it. Um, the people who are on the ship itself are in like flowing robes, uh, and they have like strands of ribbon that flow off of their shoulder pieces, almost like two mini capes that come off. Um, the colors of them is, is just a smattering. The crew doesn't seem to have like an organized feel to them. If anything, they feel more like a traveling circus. Like everyone is dressed differently, except for those capes. Everyone has those two capes that come off, but they're all different colors. The captain has been seen numerous times. He's super friendly. He comes out. Uh, you are allowed anywhere on the deck of the ship. And then when you go down, you're allowed in the um, four rooms that they have with dual bunk beds on each side of the wall. So you get a total of eight eight beds you can share. Everston, they say you can stay on the deck if you want. You can, you can stay near the stage. Um, or if you want, you can stay in cargo. Uh, but we have no way to bring you up from cargo except through there. And they point to like the, the big area where a crane would lower things in. Because <laughs> their ship has got a small belly. They're a traveling vessel. They're not large. Uh, but they're, tra- they're more traveling for like entertainment purposes. So up to you, Everson. Where would you stay on the ship? Everson would stay on the deck. He okay. he loves flying on ships, and that's the whole point of him coming along on this trip is because he really enjoys airship travel. Okay. So uh, you're on the deck of the ship. Uh, the crew on the ship is, you think it's 20? But like the next day you'll see like 30 people. And then you won't see 10 of those people for our two of the days of the trip. Now, there are a core group that you always see that are always there, that you can always talk to. Like, the captain is there. Uh, he says he doesn't have a, a first mate. He has nobody who co-pilots with him. It's just him. Bigger than life. It's only him who does it. Uh, but you don't see... Like, there's no one for cannons? As a matter of fact, you don't even think there's cannons on this ship? You don't even know how they would defend themselves as a trade vessel? Hmm. Everyone What's the captain's name? Ship? Uh, the captain's name is uh, Bendelbust. Captain Bendelbust. Okay. <clears throat> uh, and he, he's like, the crew is more than welcome to help you with any accommodations as long as you stay within the regulations of only being on the first deck and and the quarters. Uh, the rest of the ship is, how shall I say it, not safe for regular passengers. We have too many things here that uh, go boom. Uh, that's fine, Gov. Um, we totally get that. We're not regular passengers, though. If something comes up and you need a hand, let us know. He can lift stuff. Uh, ah, yes, yes, yes. I was told I'm a binder you- of the Emerald Order, so if you need anything in that regard... What's what's bound to your your engine, by the way? I'm very curious. Oh, that's a, that's a trade secret. Oh, well, fair enough. Uh, speaking of trade secrets, um, mm-hmm. would you possibly have a workspace that I could make use of on the trip? I don't know if our onboard alchemist would be okay with sharing his space. Uh, I totally I understand. Him? What are you doing? Uh, well, I was uh, I was gonna make a uh, a little boon companion, you might say. I've uh, I've got the uh, the makings and the know how to uh, craft an onyx dog. I'm not sure if you know what that is. Um, I do not. But it's a uh, basically it's a statue, and it becomes real, and it it helps and serves you for a little bit, oh. and then it goes back to being a statue. Yes, yes, yes. I, I have a, um, I have an Thomas bird that that uh, you'll see around the ship here and there. It keeps an eye on things for me. Really? Is it mm. is it clockwork or is it uh, is it steam? How, like how does it move? Again, that'd be a trade secret. 
Come on, Gav. You can give me you can give me a roll if you want to try to convince I this guy. Absolutely could. I absolutely could, and I'm gonna fucking do it, because I wanna know. Um what is my diplomacy? Plus six. Five. Eh, eleven. Yes, yeah, so, you know, maybe on the trip back, if things go well, you are um someone that we can feel is a trustworthy individual. So I get that you're helping Merrifield out, but look at it in the big in the big leagues. We go from Kadra to Holdena. Uh, we've went as far east into the Red Sands. So, again... Really? I, All right. I, and, and All like right. You, you seem like likable people, but, you know, trust matters. I, I get how crews work, mate. I'm, I was born on one, so... I've heard the Calcor name before. Your family is um, quite good at what they do. They are. They are. We are, actually, I should say. I was just going to say, are you no longer part of the clutch? But never mind. No, no, no. I, I absolutely am. Um, no one was doing what I uh, set off to do. So I went with Mom's good brace and uh, trying to make a name myself and... Um, you know, show support for the family, help them out whenever they can. Uh, let's talk about them actually coming here at some point. So, oh, well, we do love coming to smaller cities for our performances. We find that it allows us to build a bigger audience, and as these ghost towns get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, uh, so does our fame. So we oh, visit yeah. them. Oh ground, yeah, ground floor up. I totally get that. Uh, you got it. You got it. Uh, we originally started in Eisenheim. Uh, we love the Squall, which is where we're going, but um, mm. there's been a band there playing a a, a, a group of um, spectral lyricist or, or, or something. They died during the sundering, and now they just play these ghostly instruments, and I'll be honest with you, we haven't found a way to draw people away from the performances back to our ship, so we have something we're going to do when we go, and we're going to see if it works. But enough of that. Um, if you would like to wait here, I will go downstairs. I will get uh, I will get Pra and bring him up, um, and if... if Pradover is interested in sharing his space. Maybe you can build down there. I'll sell it as in, uh, maybe he can learn to make things, I think. And he, like, wanders away and makes his way downstairs. So on stage, while you guys are flying, every single minute, there is somebody on the stage mastering their performance. So basically, the crew members are divided between half day of work, half day of training for performance, and it's starting to make sense why their crew is so damn big. Big. Got it. It's almost double the size it needs to be. Um, do you stick to the areas they are asking you to stay to? Does yes. Does anyone try to go anywhere? Okay. Everston, I mean, obviously you're on the deck. You can't really go anywhere else. Uh, <laughs> uh, you're, yeah, you'll... Uh, he's a bit conspicuous, that one. <laughs> yeah, Everston will stay on the deck. He is very... Um, as he always is, kind of lost in thought, looking to the horizon, watching, you know, but every once in a while, if if uh, someone will, you know, be around from the crew, he'll ask a few questions about this or that, like the function of the ship. Uh, yeah, give me just a general, um, I would say diplomacy for carousing with people. It's kind of talking, seeing what's going on, because you're obviously not trying to scare them, like, what do you do here? Um... <laughs> Who is your daddy and what does he do? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I was waiting for it. I was waiting for it. I knew I would signal that and it would happen. <laughs> Where is Bucky uh, and what is he had? <laughs> what, what am I rolling? Uh, which skill? Diplomacy. Diplomacy? Yeah. Uh, 12. Persu or persuasion, I guess, depending on which way you want to go about it. Uh, yeah, that's all diplomacy. Nope, nope. That's that's the best I got. 12. <laughs> So, people are friendly. They talk about what they do on the ship. They just say they're uh, traveling. Um, one person does say, we are a traveling carnival. But they are quickly corrected. It's like, no, no, no. We are a performance troupe. We are not a carnival. Carnivals are for, well, not us. <laughs> we are a troupe. It's like, oh, we're a performance troupe. Uh, there's, you know, between 30 to 45 of us, depending on travel. So you at least get a number. 
And you can tell 30 to 45 by travel. Like, he, his tone seems to sound like moment to moment, not like port to port. Hmm. We've got something going on. So, um, you guys wander around. A couple hours later, Voss, while you're, you know, setting your room up, you get a knock on the door. Uh, the rooms are bunks. Uh, the top ones are solid. The ones underneath are hammocks. Uh, there Next. is a small table in this room. Uh, the top. He'd take a hammock. Has, the top bunk has a chest that hangs off of it. Like it's almost like um, the balcony flower pots, where it has the two L shapes and hangs. It's mm-hmm. like that, except it's a chest that you could put your stuff in. Like a footlocker. There, yeah. There is no lock on it. Then there is one on the ground, and there's no lock on that. It's it's the latch. But there's no lock piece to put in, no padlock or anything like that. You could use your own. There's room. Um, mm. In your room, there are two other people in it. Uh, there is a uh, halfling couple that are sharing the top. Uh, and then in the bottom hammock, uh, there is a man dressed in really, really tattered clothing. Thick, thick robes. Looks like they're made for winter, but they have that burlap, burlap-like style to them. Like, you could see... The, the thread count. <laughs> it's like cheesecloth. Yeah, and he is wearing layer upon layer. And it is cold. So we are playing in Faith, uh, which would be the equivalent to January. And you guys are flying. So this trip is fucking chilly. Okay. But he is bundled up downstairs, and the ship is fairly warm. Each room, uh, you have tiny little um, burners. Uh, and there are actually stacks that go out the side of the ship. So you have a little warmer in your room that at least makes it a non-freezing level. That's good. It's like a little ship, like wood-burning it's... stove. Yep, it's a little wood, wood burner. Uh, okay. In the hallway, there is a full wall with wood where you can go out and grab some, put it in if you need to heat it. Um, and it's small enough that like it'd be really hard to turn this into something that would burn your room down. Because, I mean, it's maybe a cast iron about that big. But it is big yeah. enough to put a pot of water on to heat food and so on. Challenge accepted, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, but on the top deck, Everston, they do ask if the cold is bothering you, things like that. Uh, there, Where you would go into the captain's quarters, there's an overhang there. Uh, they can close that in for you. There's basically like a, a piece for performances where they would close it. It's like a wood slide of wall with some fabric. Or if you want to, uh, if you sit next to the bow of the ship, which is raised up as well, where they have the stage for training, uh, if you sit next to that, they say the wind is usually less. The other option is they can open up the floor and they can lower you down into the cargo hold. But they feel bad because you're going to be down there with boxes. I think up in the bow be the best. <laughs> kind of put your back to it. You can cover yourself. They'll bring out some big blankets for you and things like that. Um, the Arch. one thing is a little different being on airship is all the blankets have ringlets on them and you attach your blanket to an object on the ship hmm. so that the blanket does not go why are you are you combing your beard on stream <laughs> so the blanket doesn't go out are you are you trying to promote right now no no it just it feels good so uh it goes the blanket would trail off but it doesn't leave the ship uh, mostly because if you lose all your blankets it's really hard to get another one unless you get to a port so for, for that four hours, you get a knock on the door. The door's open. The halflings have been going in and out getting wood. They got the fire going. They're really friendly people. Uh, but you get a knock on the door, and a um, short human, not, not a dwarf, uh, with a, a really, like, tamed and refined beard with a big bead in it, holding it together. And it goes down to probably, like, here on him. Uh, and the big bead is on the outside of it got a bunch of tiny vials on it. So what was a bead that's like this big uh. is now a bead that is like this big. <laughs> and it hangs, and then he's got the beard in a knot. And you're guessing if this thing was untied, it'd be down to, like, belt length. Okay. Um, he's got a winter cap on. Um, he looks like he's maybe in his 50s. And he goes, uh, the captain told me... Uh, you needed a shop, or at least a tool bench. Are you pra? Yeah, pra Dover. Oh, Voss Calco. Pleasure. I'll hold up my hand. to meet you. Um, oh yeah, he would he would shake as well. Uh, he is wearing gloves. Uh, the gloves have a bunch of burn holes in the back of them, 
that there's still a little bit of smoldering on them. He goes, oh, uh, pats it out. He's like, sorry about that. Uh, I, it didn't go well. You know. It happens. It does. A lot. So, uh, you're looking for a tool bench? Uh, if you want to follow me down the hall uh, and down to the next deck. Normally, we don't let anyone down here, so avert your eyes. Right. On it. So he walks and he waits till everybody goes back in their rooms and he puts a key in and unlocks the door and opens it. And as soon as it opens up, it is loud. You hear okay. people chanting, cheering, drinking, and you open into this big room with a bunch of tables that looks like a huge tavern. It's the size of the okay. ship. It's not like the TARDIS, but everyone's partying. Right. There's gambling going on. There are dancers in the room. You guys walk through this, like, gambling den to the next set of doors, and he unlocks that one. There's a big guy standing at the door. Uh, he kind of nods to him. He's like, Dover. He's like, hey, how you doing, buddy? He's like, same as always, watching strippers, making money, getting free drinks. He's like, it's the life. And he opens the door and wanders through. And I'm assuming you don't hang out in the den and you follow him. I do. Kind of give the bouncer a nod, like, Gov, walk through. And he's, he's just kind of, yeah, another body, as you kind of walk through. And as soon as you pass, someone else walks up to him, big smile on his face, hugging the guy, kind of rubbing him on the head as the door shuts behind. And it goes silent, like dead silent again in here. And Dover goes, sorry about that. See, the den, we try to keep away from public. We never know what city we're in, and if if people are going to... It's, it's understandable, piss. mate. This, uh, it was very hard to avert my eyes. Yeah, the dancers, they are amazing, and the money. I mean, oh, the money. I I, I don't know how the Flying Lyrist set this up, but... Oh, yeah, yeah. And he wanders downstairs. Like, you could see he's, like, remembering moments. <laughs> As you wander down and through... Uh, you go down a spiral staircase, which is not normally on a ship, mm. into a front of the very bow of the ship in a pocket room in the front that's like tucked away in like the bend of the front of the ship. This used to be an old naval vessel, very similar to the Whisper, so it's got that body of a ship that would be on water, which doesn't exist anymore, at least mm. not as we know it. Uh, he's got a tool bench set up in the very front of the ship, um, a couple of shelves. Uh, he's got a small jeweler's anvil. But what he does have that is really different is out of what used to be the window, like a little port window, he has got a furnace set up for glass blowing. Oh, wow. Nice. He's like, I, I can't do large glass blowing, but I can't do small. And you notice like the door um, behind him, there's a bunch of like gouges and stuff in it from him using the pole and like gouging the door because he forgot to open it. It's a uh -huh. tight space. You're talking like <laughs> maybe three foot at the front and then the width of the ship, you know, for the room, but it's only about five foot deep. Okay. And the entire room is covered in some like odd material. It doesn't look like glass. It doesn't look like wood. Give me a check if you want. Uh, what do you want for that? Nature? Uh, crafting? Mm, I would say, give me a craft. Arcana? That makes sense. Craft. Craft? Mm-hmm. No tools, I'm assuming, so. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's gonna be a 17. Uh, you've heard of it. You've not seen it. Um, it is originally made out of Holdenar. You use a certain set of berries that grow in the mountains, uh, but it is frost pitch. It is made to make something fireproof. Oh, neat. Also, very smart. Be like, is this place covered in frost pitch? Oh, yes. Do you know what that is? Are you a fellow right. chemist? Well... I, I dabble. I'm uh, I'm part of the Emerald Order. I see, and he pokes whatever patch you have on. Like, physically pokes it. Yep, right there. And, and um, when he touches never... it, his entire glove turns green. 
just like the emerald on your patch. Oh, huh. that's dandy. You graduated, and he like repeats when you graduated and repeats the ceremony. What did that look like when you graduated? What was the ceremony? Oh God. Um, I'll, I'll, you know what? I will pause there and go to Everston while you think. <laughs> well, how big was the class? Your choice. So just okay. contemplate. So Everston up top, people have wandered around. Um, you haven't seen another Thomas on board. Um, a small girl uh, that's maybe 10 to 12 uh, wanders up with her father. Uh, and the father goes, um, we're staying in the room um, across from the feathered uh, friend who's with you, the, uh, the Volg. But my daughter has never seen an Thomas. We, we come from way far south, uh, past Worthington. And we're taking this to Eisenheim to see her, her grandparents. Uh, but she wanted to know if, if she could, she could uh, uh, shake your hand. She's never seen a Thomas before. And I said, I said, they're, ju they're just like us. They're the soul of somebody. Just go up and say hi. And you can see the little girl is clutching um, a small porcelain headed doll. Um, it's beautifully made. The dress is gorgeous. Um, and she whispers to it pretty frequently. And the father would say, um, this is her, her mother. Um, it's the reliquary that we have. And it's the only thing we had a value to put her in. So she talks to her mother frequently. And it's like, it's not even the day of remembrance. It's like a fucking Monday. Huh? So she's just doing it to do so. And she goes, can I, can I, can I shake your hand? And, uh, Everson is more than willing to show off the, uh, superiority of a well-built <laughs> <laughs> automat. <laughs> so he'll kind of like, shrug off the tarp blanket that he's been sort of wrapped around with a cloak or whatever, you know, like mm -hmm. the calibretto from uh, Battle Chasers. Anyway, uh, oh, he will... Uh, <laughs> such a callback. And he'll... Of course. He brings his hand down. He kind of like bends just a little bit so he's down close to her so he can, she can shake his hand. She says, my name's Rochelle um, and this is my dad. Uh, and she shakes her hand with, you know, one hand. She's holding the doll. She's like, my mom, my mom wandered in a Thomas body, but they're, they're so expensive. H how did you get yours? I was lucky enough to have family that arranged it long ago. But don't worry. Someday you may have one yourself along with your mother. Oh, I don't know. Mother's voice has been getting quieter and quieter uh, the last two years. She doesn't even want to talk during Remembrance anymore. Dad says that the spirit's ready to go, but has nowhere to go, and, and she's kind of receded into herself. Right, Dad? And he goes, uh, yeah, Rochelle, yeah, that's that is what I said. <laughs> and you can see he's a little pained about the conversation. And he goes, all right, all right, Rochelle, uh, let's leave, uh, uh, what was your name, sir? They call me Everston. Uh, ooh, I gotta make a roll. He goes, uh, Everston, like, like the Everston family, the the, the machinists, the, the people who help help make a Thomas for people. That Everston family. That is correct. I am the last. And you see the little girl's eyes light up. So you can make us a body. Perhaps one day, when my family business has been restored to its former glory. Uh, but for now, uh, I am unable to help anyone achieve betterment. Dad would lean down to the girl, and he's not super quiet, but just so you three can hear it. He's like, remember, we traveled through Merrifield. It's, it's, uh, it didn't survive well. Oh... Well, I hope your shop gets done. And if it does, how much does a body cost? Uh, save your wisps and someday we'll talk. Dad, you hear they only cost wisps? And he goes, yeah, yeah. I'm sure tens of thousands of wisps. 
Um, <laughs> he leans in, he shakes your hand as well. He's like, thank you for, for uh, humoring my daughter. He says, my name, my name is Henry. Uh, we're the Mondells. Uh, we're actually going to Eisenheim to, to do more than that. I am very trained in, uh, in the production of rifles. And, and they need to hire someone new to, to I guess they're arming chunk of the true faith right now so i'm hoping that i can get a job there um only problem is being from worthington cadra and, and their people aren't so fond of us but we believe you in should, true faith you should speak with my traveling companion boss calcor he has an interest in firearms he may be able to assist you or at oh, least really? pick your brain on design and repair. Well, I'll check him later. We're across the hall, or maybe during the performance tonight we will. So, I'll cut back down to Voss, and he's like, so who? He starts repeating your graduation, the moment that it happened. <clears throat> so, he probably would have seen um, Voss was a little tipsy uh, during his ceremony, because um, there were 18 people in the class. He graduated 17 out of 18. Okay. Um, or I should say he graduated second out of 18 because first of the class would have been uh, this uh, human woman that studied very hard, uh, very diligently, and Voss didn't because ah. he's just that good. And he took second in the class um and that's why you're in a uh, ghost it, town. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean he also he also secured the uh uh what's it called? The work study for his professor. Oh. Uh, just because he was like he's really good at this stuff. He just didn't give a shit. He partied a lot. Um and he was looked down on because of that. Uh but he still graduated second in his class because, because someone actually put the work in. Um, but it was him being a little bit tipsy, uh, possibly naked under the graduation robe, uh, just in case the <laughs> opportunity presented itself for him to, to fast times at Ridgebine High. Yeah. Um, so it was uh, <laughs> a lot of a lot of pomp and circumstance. Um, his family was not there um, just because they were off working, uh, which he understood. So he didn't put a whole lot of faith, not of faith. He didn't put a whole lot of heart into the ceremony it was just like yeah cool we're done let's thanks for my papers go yeah <laughs> give me my paper i'm ready let's let's get on with it i need to go to work um so it was it was very nonchalant the whole business of his graduation so he repeats that back to you and he goes oh i apologize uh, the glove um it sees the moments that an object is gifted to someone um, I got it as a way to help me identify alchemical uh, um, potions uh, quickly. Uh, and it sounded like a great idea. Uh, but then I realized that the first time a potion is given, um, usually it gets drank. So I was touching a lot of empty bottles. But I, I have learned formulas that way, which has been very entertaining. Really? If I find something that's, that was first crafted a lot of times... Yeah, if that potion has never been made by an individual before, but they don't get a chance to use it because, say, um, they die out somewhere here in, you know, the ghost areas, the ghost lands. Um, those potions, sometimes I can learn formulas for. But but enough of that. Um, the shop is small. Um, I do have a few moments that I'm not going to be working on it over the course of the week there and the week back. Um, I heard you wanting to build a trinket, which... And he turns around and he like folds up the shelves and they seem to like roll in between the beams on the wall. And he hears some shit fall down inside his put shelf up and he turns around next to the door. Uh, he closes the door and he pulls a huge workbench down, which would block the door in this tiny ass space. And he Got picks, it. A, picks a tool kit up and sets it down. He's like, trinkets I do. And he sets the little blacksmith anvil up and he sets up a, 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 a series of tools for carving gems. Um, he goes... Perfect. That's exactly what I need. And he pulls out a chunk of obsidian. Oh. He's like, I need to ref I need to refine this, shape it down, and then I need to uh, 
put the finishing touches on it to make it an actual reliquary. Um, hmm. What do you? What do you? What and do you uh, think? is it something fun? Have you ever heard of an onyx dog? No. No. Is that a fresh it, spirit? It will be. It's uh oh. it's got well I mean normally you can do this magically, but the way I work, I can use souls to do the same thing. Ah. Uh, I guess. But I'll bind one to it and it'll be uh it'll be just like a, a companion or a um an ally. For a certain amount of time before it has to rest and then it comes back so it's nifty but um between you and me there's a bloke in town where i'm at in merrifield that's making these and they're just ugly as sin so what i'm gonna do is i'm gonna do it right so that he can see how it works it mate it's burning the soul off as it goes like it it just it runs on it like fuel it's leaking oh, you can't right have a leaking it's soul. fucking terrible man it's have absolutely you... yeah have you ever encountered the tiny remnants of spirits that stay alive when they leak off? They're mad. They're absolutely crazy. Spirits that well, are- Well, yeah, wouldn't you be? Oh, they're a part of First a First you die, then the rest of you gets burned away, and it's just like, oh, well, there's just a little bit left, so have enough. You're the we, waste. Yeah, we flew south to uh, Wooflock. Uh, that's where we're coming. We went through Wooflock to Worthington and a few of the ghost towns in between. Performances were not so great, but- um. We had an entire group of those little splintered off spirits. I didn't know spirits could be in a swarm. Most frightening thing I. I've ever seen. Most frightening thing. Did anyone die? Well, I can tell you that they can't possess you very long, but they possess you for mere moments. Uh, and uh, the people who were dancing, ooh, buddy. Lost one, jumped overboard. That's horrible. It is. It seems to control you for just brief seconds in time, but when there's so many of them, it, they fight over control of your body. It's like uh, if a dozen spirits were trying to possess you. That sounds problematic at the least. Well, I mean, she was a bad dancer, so it's not like we lost a lot. Right. Um, wait, so you're saying... I saw the alignment track go ka -ding, ka -ding, ka -ding. one way Just in the nice, bad direction. Nice, nice, nice. Pegged. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, now he's thinking, oh, shit. If we've got dogs running around that are doing this, that might be a thing in Merrifield eventually then. That's already full of spirits because it's a ghost town. Yeah, no, that's fucking great. Okay, cool. Well, so uh, I'd be I'd be happy to help you with this. Right, I'm really I'll, good at carving uh, gems. Very skilled. All right. What type well, of dog would you like? What do you want it to look like? I can make it look like anything. What do the hounds most look like? Dobermans. Dobermans. Let's do a Doberman. Oh, you're gonna make it the same? Fuck yes. I thought you were going to make a totally different dog, like a St. Bernard no, or something. No, no, fuck that. No. We're going to make a Doberman that looks like an actual Doberman. That's how it should be. Okay, what do you have to roll to craft this? Um. Well, my bonus with tools is at an 11. So, on the... We normally the, don't pull out see. books on, on side quests, but I'm going to here. Uh, I, what I'm <laughs> curious about is... Well, I'm looking the at... For it's a second level. I think the DC is a 16. I'm looking. There you go. Okay, okay. So so it's a level two item. You're crafting it. Um, Praw, Praw Dover is, can craft the dog for you if you want. And he's good at it. I mean, yeah. If if he if he's so down he'll to. Basically make the relic and then you can take the time to turn it into a reliquary and do all stuff. He'll just make you the object that is reliquary worthy. Yeah, so he's totally. Like, yeah, I would, I would love to make this for you, mostly to show that our skill is better than this inferior person. Right. <laughs> See, we're on the same page. You and I, we're, we're gonna get along. You might say, uh, cut from the same cloth. And he touches whatever robe you're wearing. 
and he draws okay. whatever that memory is. Boundaries, mate. Boundaries. Yeah. No. This one. Small space. Um, sorry, sorry. Is he's like moving across from you? Like, uh, do I need to do a perception to see what he's doing, or does he just do it? Yeah, absolutely. Give me a perception it, check. Is there is there a save for it? No. Okay. Because you're, I'm assuming your robe is not magical. I, I don't. No, it's not. I don't fucking see it. And I'm assuming your, and I'm assuming the badge for the Emerald Order also isn't magical. It's just the, it's just no, the badge. it's not. Yeah. Then there's no save. Um, so you would see, um, this robe was, uh, this robe was given to him by his mother. Um, another and it vulture, was on the, another one of the vulture. Yeah. Like, right, okay. Yeah. What does she um, look like? Do you know? She is, um, uh, all the Calcors are jet black. They look like, uh, Todd, what was the bird that we used for it? It was just a black vulture, right? Black vulture. Yep. Yeah. So it's a black vulture, um, except she is, um, uh, she has a white head and it kind of like, uh, like there's like a white speckling that comes off the head and just like the head's all white feathers. And then um, the mantle just kind of speckles out into from the white into black. Um, and this was given to him on the day that he left for school. Like she bought it, she procured it for him. Um, and he's it's been like his dress robe yeah. ever since. Um, Makes sense. So like, yeah, that was when it was given to him. <clears throat> and he says, uh, he's like, your mother's uh, quite attractive. Is he like takes the onyx out that you've given him. He starts drawing in a wax pen on it. Like, what do you mean? Uh, oh. Apologize. A, a tight space. Um, Dirty pool. I just kind of like shake my finger at him. You know what it does? It lets me see who people are and if I want to work with them or not. That's fair. That's pretty, it's pretty handy, actually. You don't have another one of those, do you? Nope, nope, nope. Had to stitch the hand on myself. Sorry, what? Stitch the hand on. The glove was attached to him. I think it's a cursed item. But uh, and he like pulls the sleeve up, and he's got like a perfect line. And then there's like almost like a perfect band of what would look like like a super glue band around his wrist. Uh huh. And it is a different skin tone. You can see a little bit underneath the glove. So is it the glove or is it the hand that does that? Oh, it's the glove. It's the glove. I just couldn't get it off the hand. It's cursed. It's locked to it. I tried everything. Did you... Were you already missing a hand? Or was oh, it... Wait. Yeah, yeah, you... yeah, yeah. Quite some time ago. I, I was working uh, with the forge. There was an explosion. Uh, I lost Go use figure. of my fingers. Um, I could still do good stuff, but my craftsmanship went down. And so, replaced that thing. You know. Like an Thomas part, except uh, real digits. Right. Little creepy, not gonna lie. But, you know, if it works, go Don't for it. Don't we kind of live in a world of creepy? As he, like, uh, starts you, drawing all the lines wrong, and, you, and you hear the first pink, 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 pink. And for six hours, you guys talk and chat as he works on this Onyx dog. So, I have a plus... <laughs> when, uh, he get, when he gets to the head, Voss is yeah. like, oh, and, and don't dock the ears. Really? You want to don't, don't make him point. Yeah, floppy. You know, natural, the way it should be. Just gonna stick it to this bloke. I mean, <laughs> your choice, friend. And he, like, chips away and makes the ears. And he rounds them out, and they got the little tips that curl up. Um, and it has, like, a real, like, sits in that perfect position, like a dog who's trained that is, is ready to do its job. I rolled an 18 on the die. And he's got a plus Ooh. 15. So he critically crafts you this beautiful piece of work and he's like the rest is you my friend uh i know you need a basin and he sets down a piece for like salt water um mm -hmm. and he sets down a jug for water and he sits back <laughs> and he folds a bench out of like the bow of the ship and sets down he goes do you smoke i don't do just because what what are we talking here and he reaches down and he takes like a, there's like a small box in the corner. He takes it, sets it down, opens up on his lap, pulls out this like bright, bright crimson red leaves. And he rolls them up. 
Hang on. Is he this putting a... putting inside of a pipe. Is this a medicinal slash... Uh, no. It slows... Sporting it's, venture? It slows time in a way that allows you to uh, master your craft. On a failure, it makes something a success. On a critical failure, it makes it a failure. So it basically bumps it up. Oh, neat. And an hour later, you're licking the walls. Very yeah. expensive. Uh, the downside, though, <laughs> is you sleep for a few days afterwards. How much longer do we have on this ride? Because I can't take that chance if we're... Oh, uh, this will be day one, so five more. Right, when in Kadra, and um, we're not on Kadra. You're on the flying list, and he like packs it, lights it, and he he's not even crafting anymore, and he takes a hit and then passes it to you. Right. All right, so it's I need a, a fortitude pipe. save. It's a pipe. I need a fortitude save. Boy, it's a long silver stick, uh, with two hands that hold it at the end. One hand is a different color than the other. <laughs> Made it myself. It's glass. Neat. As the aroma hits him, hang on a second. I gotta roll some percentiles here. Uh, it smells like fall pre-sundering. <clears throat> uh, yeah, rolled low. He's like, oh, this shit. Yeah, I know what this is. Mm -hmm. he, I partied a lot in school. Also, I'm really good at my job and some... <laughs> Actually, there was, uh, there was a siren that, uh, that gave me some of this. It at uh, one of the parties, and, um, well, let's just say, uh, <laughs> my, uh, my companion is very happy that I smoked this that day. Right. <clears throat> Gonna use a hero point. Ooh, okay. That bad, huh? Yeah. Okay, so up success to crit, or, uh, one point. All right, so go ahead. What do you got with your? What do you got with your? Come on, just shatter this beautiful fucking onyx creation that he's made. Hi, my name is Matthew Lillard. You've probably seen me in many a horrible movie back in the '90s. Can we start again? It's me, Matt. Hi, I'm a major motion picture star Matthew Lillard. Uh, hi. All right, all right Sam. I'm Matthew Lillard. <laughs> What's the line? <laughs> you just do whatever the fuck. I almost had it. I got a booger on my shirt. What's the first line? I was in terrible movies during the 90s. You grew up on them and you watched them, sucker. My name is Matthew Lillard. You may know me as Beetle from Beetle and Grimm's. Last couple of years, our company is focused primarily on the DM, creating battle maps, in-world handouts, jewelry items, and of course, stuffed animals. Now it's time to focus on you, the players. Because when we gather around a table, we're not there to hear a story, we're there to tell a story, all of us. And sometimes that story goes on for years and is remembered only on coffee-stained scraps of paper or three random journals. But worst of all, it's in your head. And why is that bad? Because I'm not that smart. Bill's way smarter than me. When he says it's Grimm that killed the frost giant that was on its way to destroy the town, I can't really argue with him because I don't have it on a journal. And if I had it in a journal, sitting on a bookshelf, you could just say, hey, check out my journal. We all know the problem with a journal. In a real game, when are you gonna use that thing? On a real night of gaming, you bounce from a core rule book to the advanced player's guide, and of course your character sheet. And the entire game goes like boom, to boom, to boom, to boom, to boom, 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 boom. You never go back to this thing. And again, the story is only in your brain, and Bill's telling you that he is the real champion. But what if? Stay with me here. What if, Charlie? Charlie, thanks. What if we created a single book specifically tailored for your character class? And what if it had an enormous character sheet to record every detail of your character, 
every stat, every strength, weakness, magic item, enemy, ally, even your familiar. And then took all the official Pathfinder rules, the spells, feats, and skills that you need for your class and your class only and combined that with an expansive journal to capture your story. And obviously it's only useful if it's on heavy paper to handle the years of wear and tear and bound on a lay flat binding so you can use every inch of it. And of course, us being us, we add amazing artwork from across the Pathfinder universe, as well as our own custom pieces commissioned specifically for this book. And that's why I'm here today, to introduce you to Beetle and Grimm's complete character chronicle. Character sheet, rule book, journal, all in one. The tools to tell your story and the pages to preserve. If my story had been included in one of these, I'm pretty sure that Beetle, the greatest dungeon delver ever, would have been the true hero of the group. Not Bodum, not Tanner, and definitely not Grimm. Because it all would have been written down, the incontestable truth. Or at least, a well-documented lie. Which is just as good. I'm Matthew Lillard, and we are Beetle and Grimm. Well, that one would have done it. So Ooh. that's why I used it. Uh, I rolled an 11, so that's a 22. So that's a success. So that ups it to a critical success. Fine. So you finish making this over the time frame, and everything takes less time for you down to a minimal of one day, and you're, you're, you salt bath it, and <clears throat> it's coated, and you start chipping off an area of salt to put the soul in for it. Um, what soul are you using? Um, it would have been one of the ones that, uh, that I would have had housed when I came here. Okay. Like one, one of the few. So it's um, a person and not a dog then? Uh, yeah, we'll say it was, um, uh, it's probably one of the guard from New Bolivar, um, that didn't have any family. Cause I, Voss is, sure. um. He uses diplomacy. He doesn't use intimidation unless the soul is evil. Um, yep. But he uh, he basically talked to him and was like, "Look, if I can find a use for you to you know to carry on and do what you what you were doing, would you be interested in that?" And he agreed. So cool. it would be we'll have to, uh, we'll have to come be, up with a name for this guy. Uh, Reginald is his name. All right. So I so probably I probably actually I probably wouldn't. I'll probably name the dog Reggie. Okay. <clears throat> so if you finish making Reggie, uh, you guys sit back. He's like, the tiredness kicks in almost immediately. So I'm going to warn you that um, you may be sleeping in here unless you think you can run through the den in time to make it back to your room. Well, I don't. Fort save. <clears throat> Fort save. Yeah, you get down. Okay. 17. Cool, it's a 20. You pass out. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think. And as you see, he's like, I know what you. <laughs> so two of you, you in this Erica, tiny I've been gaming for a long time. Room. For a while, I just rolled because I yeah, knew it was coming. Yeah. It's a 10 foot <laughs> wide room that's like five foot deep, and you're both are just head to head passed out. <laughs> <laughs> so the days go by. It's super smooth. You do wake up three days later. You guys go. He takes you into the den to get food. You guys get to eat, hang out. Everston, over those three days, um, what was, no, you guys don't need to work on the ship, turns into winds being really bad. Them asking you to give a hand, like getting the sails right. Uh, you almost lost a bunch of cargo from a horrible breeze coming out of the mountains or a wind coming out of the mountains. Um, are you pretty good at uh, athletics? Yes. Okay. My best skill. I'm an expert. Give me an athletics check. Let's see how much you helped them during these these three days that his ass is pat. And you have not seen him for three days. <laughs> okay. 26. 26. Okay. Damn, sucker. So you save all the cargo with their help. You get the wins done and everything's good. Uh, and one of the one of the crew members that's there says, um, do you like to gamble? Never really done much damage. Do you like to party? I have no need. Um, what do you like? 
Listen, I'm trying to help. I'm trying to give you something for helping us here. We are not allowed to trade monetary value for services here. It's part of the Lyrist rule. Trade for trade, not not trade for money. Glad to be of help. I do enjoy the airship where they can bring you. Oh. Well, I'll tell you what. How would you like a ticket for free passage to anywhere you want to go as long as the Lyrist is going? I don't just mean this okay, route that we are currently doing. But, like, I'm talking, do you want to see the other side of the world? You'd have to work as a crew member. Time I would. All right. Well, one ticket, then. And he walks back to the captain. And he goes, uh, uh, Bendelbust, uh, I need, uh, I need a world-class ticket for this man. He's like, what, what, what for? He's like, he saved all the cargo. And he goes, Oh, oh, sure, sure, sure. And he goes back, and sure enough, they get a ticket. It's this gold embossed ticket. Uh, the front part of it is gold. The back part of it is like, <clears throat> like chocolate. A, a Fontia map uh, with with a like silver dashed line through it. It just curls everywhere. And it says one world class ticket at the bottom, uh, and and infinite shows while on the on the ship. He goes, you can watch every show because you'll be working. Uh, can you perform? I have never performed. Oh, I'm you've aware. never done feats of strength before. Every feat of, from an Atomus is a feat of strength. Well, we don't have an Atomus on the ship right now, so feats of strength would be great. Let me know when you want to book this world-class ticket. We'll be, we come to you at least right now because of the paths we're making. We're there at least once a month. But if you want to go somewhere, we can go anywhere in the world. You name it. All right, one world-class ticket. Thank you. Um, so over those days, you guys hang out, get to know the crew. They're all really friendly. Tons of performances go on. You can see they're practicing different pieces of it uh, because they're going into the festival uh, of faith when you arrive in Eisenheim. And sure enough, those six-day flight goes by pretty quick. The winds do die down. And the first thing you see in the distance uh, you can see the silhouette as you're arriving at night of the lights, and they use gas to light most of Eisenheim. But there are lanterns and lamps that you can see the city streets lit up. But the big thing you see is this spire, their air tire tower called the Squall. And when you get within a mile, two miles of this place, you can hear music being played. And it calls. And the captain smiles at first, but then he quickly wipes that smile off his face. He's like, that's that band that we can't beat out. But man, if they don't play good music. As you guys dock at the squall, uh, the top part is this ginormous bar, round. And inside, sure enough, when you land, there are de de debarking, debarking with all your gear. There are ghosts with instruments playing on a stage in this bar. And like, it takes up half of one of the round walls. Uh, tons of people cheering, lots of pilots here. This is a bustling city compared to even New Boulevard or compared to, obviously, Merrifield. It is so busy that it feels like a metropolis to all of you. Unless you've been to the capital, this may be the largest city that you've been to. In the distance, when you get out the windows, you can see electricity arcing from the sky and striking the top of this building and lighting up rods over and over again. They book you guys a room. Um, part of the Flying Lyrus, they say you can either stay with us or you can stay at the Squall for one night, but after that, you're on your own. Because we got here at night, we can't expect you to find a room. Uh, the captain, you know, ushers everyone off, says the performance will be tonight, but as soon as that music is heard, people don't seem interested in their performance anymore. He's like, it happens every time. Every time we come here, we can only perform when this band is performing. And they perform like 20 hours out of the day. All right, everybody. 
debark, uh, disembark, have fun, enjoy your time. We will be leaving in two days. You got two days here before the Lyris leaves. Once we're gone, you're on your own. So you guys came here with a goal. Voss, you're here to do what? Uh, <clears throat> well, the, um, whatever the hell that multi arm skeleton thing was called, I can't remember. Um, it dropped oh, a shotgun. Okay. Yep. It dropped a shotgun, and we came here to get some parts because Eisenheims are particular, like the first ones that made them, and although they are very widely used, I wanted to make sure I got stock parts for this instead of trying to make my own because I hadn't... Uh, I didn't have the knowledge of this because I'm not really a firearms guy, but since it fell on my lap and we had the time, I wanted to go... Well, this is an uh, item that specifically like. takes a blueprint to make. Like, you can make long swords and things like that without a blueprint. This item, mm -hmm. as a technological level, requires a blueprint similar to a magical item. Uh, but the biggest part about the gun that you notice when you were looking it over and whatnot is the specific mark for this is really uh, important. It looks like... Do you know the old barbershop candy cane looking um, mm -hmm. parlor poles? Yep. yep. It looks like that, but instead of that red band, it is bands of bullets that go up and around it. And hmm. that is the mark that is branded on the stock. Uh, of the the Eisenheim pump action. Um, and you know that that is from here. And specifically, and I, I hope you remember this place, Drew. You may not. Uh, it is specifically for the Bullet Parlor. The Bullet Parlor is across the street from your character's old shop. Yep. <laughs> <clears throat> Two gentlemen run it. They've been there for a long time. Uh, and they, they claim to be the people who invented the first Eisenheim uh, blueprint for mass production. Uh, it's supposed to be a pretty big size shop. That's all you know. Has Voss ever been here before? Has Everston ever been to Eisenheim before? Um, Everston's been here in a previous life, but currently oh. as he exists, no. <clears throat> okay. Uh, Voss, Voss has been here. I've rolled a 5%. Voss has been here before. Um, we'll say that he's been here. He hasn't really been um, in the town much. The um, His family ship has been here. Mm-hmm. Uh, many times just because of what they do. He sure. was always either on the ship or wasn't allowed to go very far. Um, uh, and if he did, he probably would have been hanging down in the uh, the Vogue part of town off the cliffside. Okay. Um, but he hasn't he hasn't ventured much into the town. And it certainly hasn't been recently. So probably probably hasn't been here in the last three to five years. Well, absolutely not because he was he was in he was in New Boulevard studying. So he would have been, it probably would have been a couple of years before that. So probably seven years, I'd say, okay. since he's been here. Okay. So as you are making your way through the streets, you know where it is. Uh, you, I'm assuming you're going to sleep for the night and look for this place the next morning, right? Because uh, it's like I've been sleeping for three days, yeah, so I'm not, probably not awake. Be open. He'll probably, just to get out and get on his feet, he'll probably go scope it out, find out where it is, and then come back. Well, hold on. It was a six-day travel. You did this the first day, so it was three days that you slept, and then three days that you were up. So it's not like... Oh, okay. So you definitely would... Then, yeah. Next day. ...be able to sleep. You know what I mean? Like, you don't need mm -hmm. to... You don't need to stay awake forever. <laughs> so, as you, uh... As you rest, get up next morning, ask around. You have an idea of where the shop is. That's not really a big deal. Uh, and I will take us over to the shop and the two gentlemen are there. So the outside of this place is bustling. Um, but the bustling that's going on isn't for this shop. The bustling seems to be for the shop across the street. Uh, the shop across the street has... Uh, what, what, did, what did you name your shop? Do you remember? Um... This is before I knew about the podcast. I want to say it was the Glass Cannon, but... Um, I think ah, uh, it could be but just keep because it. keep it. I, I yeah, I, it was the glass cannon because he was a wizard and everybody's like, what are you doing? It's like, I make firearms. 
pretty and sure it's it. it's kind of like um uh what the hell is the name of the hot dog place in um in chicago not pinks um i don't know you tell me yeah you're the one who lived oh, there forever God damn it no i know I, i'm blanking on it he, you like you could get like uh, he had so much like you could get like an ostrich hot dog like he had just random like oh, you know you know what i'm talking about yes i don't remember but yeah i can't yeah, remember yeah. the name of it so anyway basically he's only open when he wants to be so like the line around the corner is normal like you have to ha like there's usually a queue um, okay uh that makes sense because between adventuring and just not giving a shit like he's only open at certain parts of the, of the week um mm -hmm. Although he's been he's been there for uh, for a while lately. Um, okay, that makes sense. That makes sense to me. So you are packed. That shop is busy as all get out. Uh, so much so that the place across the street, there are two gentlemen outside smoking, uh, which are the two you see in the image here. Uh, they are not happy. Um, you can tell they're just dis disgruntled, uh, and they are talking to each other. And sure enough, they're in front of the bullet parlor. Um, there are two of those big columns, uh, and it is, instead of that red, a chain of bullets going around. They do rotate. Uh, at the top, one light works, the other one's out. The shop doesn't seem to be in the best repair anymore. I mean, it's working. And uh, as soon as you two walk up through the crowd, the one gentleman on the left uh, goes, oh, uh, are, are, are you here for the bullet parlor? I mean, and I, I look over my shoulder at the other place. I'm like, should I not be? That guy's just claimed to fame as he's an adventurer. He's not as good as us. And the guy with the big mustache he? goes, the guy, the guy with the mustache goes, okay, that man's name does not matter whatsoever. Do not worry about who he is or what he does. <laughs> what can we do for you? You kind of look again, back over again, my shoulder good again. Sir, good my... Sir. And he like <laughs> steps into your line of vision. He's like, good sir, welcome to the bullet parter. Uh, follow me upstairs. We can help you do whatever it is you need done. Uh, I heard that you were the blokes. That, yes, yes, yes. Uh, come on, come on, come mate. on. And he like, he's like ushering you in. Oh, a, a large friend, the, the door next to us, we just put it in. And it's like a set of barn doors that are on a building that barn doors shouldn't be on. Like you can tell <laughs> they're trying to be accommodating um, and they open these like big, large Appreciate doors it. and you walk in and you can see the first floor and then uh, there's a step up, like a halfway step where you can look into the second floor and they have an L-shaped desk, but up here is their machine shop and they, they walk you up and there are parts of guns littering this place. The entire wall, um, the like, I think it's eight pieces of wall that are here are aligned in like racks for weapons where they just have guns hanging all over the place. <laughs> some of them in good repair, some of them not. And there is one that is finished with a old dusty sign that says Eisenheim, born and raised. And below that are different versions of the Eisenheim shotgun. And they seem to be from like the base model, you know, to the best model. So, so, uh, what exactly are you here for? <clears throat> Um, Voss looks at that sign and tries to pick out which one he thinks he's holding. None of them. At least I'm first class. Oh, neat. Okay. If you want to go over and take um, a closer look, you can. And you were you said you didn't remember what those skeletons were called. Uh, the skeletons are the sir, the silver carpus. They are the four armed version. Um, of carpus the or carapus? Carpus. C a r p u s. Carpus. Oh, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. He's like, uh, what can we do? I, I see you have mini guns on you. Uh, what well, at least, is that an Eisenheim? That sure looks like an Eisenheim. The other guy goes, yes, it's an, Walter. It's an Eisen, it is an Eisenheim, duh. <laughs> you can look at right. it, you know the craftsmanship. So, um, long story short, I inherited this off a dead body. Um, looking to uh, see what it needs to get fixed up. Imagine going into a shop in the real world and saying, like, yeah, I inherited this from a dead body. Can you tell me what it's worth? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, it's true. Like, yeah. And he so says it just dead. Great turn of phrase. <laughs> I love it. Walter goes, 
uh, Angelo, obviously they have a, a fine specimen of a, of a gun here. It was probably crafted by us. Uh, and he takes, you know, may, may I see, may I see your gun? I look at the other guy, I'm like, is this bloke all right? Walter, uh, he's very uh, enthusiastic about his work. He is the best gunsmith in the city. Maybe the best in all of Angrad. Uh-huh. Right. And then, um, so they take off their jackets. They put on leather aprons. One's wearing a, gr a sorry, a brown leather apron uh, with uh, the Eisenheim blueprint, like, embossed on it, like the rough version of it. The other one mm -hmm. is wearing a black apron with gold that looks like a safe. Like the style mm. of it looks like a safe, a gun safe. And he goes, <clears throat> if you would give me the honor of touching this fine, fine, fine gun. This firearm right. is obviously in Hand need of some tender love and care. <laughs> Hand it over to him. So he takes it, sets it down, and he kind of rubs his hands together, and he takes out tools. He's oh, may I clean it sure go i'm assuming go you've nuts. Used, he goes magic has been used on this before i'm assuming you've used prestidigitation to like clean the gun oh yeah and he goes mm, yes, yes yes it needs to be oiled uh, it's missing this and he flips it over and he's like it even has our stamp on it and it has that bullet parlor stamp on it yeah. i was gonna grease it but i didn't know if it would ruin the wood so Anyway, but no yeah. No worries. I, I will take a look at this. Uh, uh, Anglo can show you around to any other weapon you would like to buy. Uh, just look around, look around, and he like starts taking no, the no. gun apart meticulously. No, mate, I'm not. I'm not here to buy another one. I want the parts right, to right, fix right, this right, one. Right, but, 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 but this takes time. So you and your fine, fine Thomas friend should look around, shop, buy things. We have plenty of bullets. Right. Carry on. And he just stands there. Okay, so you stand there. Uh, <laughs> uh, Angelo goes, yeah, I apologize for his enthusiasm. He thinks everybody is buying, but we maybe sell one to three pieces a week now because of the glass cannon across the street. Um, and it's weird because, I mean, that man mostly sells pistols, and we sell rifles and firearms of, of great caliber. But um, may I ask you, Mr. Calcor, and, uh, uh, I'm assuming you are a Calcor, correct? Me? Yeah. Yeah. Ah, excellent. Your, your mother buys from us quite frequently. Yeah, she does. Oh. Actually, last time I remember being here, she came, I think, yeah, to you, you guys a, to you get uh, some one. weapons. Little I was, little yeah. But you, I don't recognize. And he points to, like, Everson, where, like, the floor is, like, on here on him, and he's, like, looking into the room, standing on a box. <laughs> he's like, I don't recognize you. No, oh, he's yeah. Everston, Everston. Uh, do we know it, Everston? Uh, Walter. Walter doesn't respond. He goes, hmm, the name rings a bell, but I just can't place the sound of the bell. Hmm. Uh, do either one of you have firearms on you that you would like cleaned? For visiting, I will I will clean them and uh, give them a quick maintenance one over for free. Nope, this is all I got. Oh, uh, you, Mr. Everston. I am inexperienced firearm. Inexperienced? Like I said, he's new. We have a, we own a gun range just outside of the city. It isn't a, it is a, it is a beauty of an outdoor range. It is cold, but we would be more than happy to take you there to test anything that you have or like to fire any guns. And Walter goes, yes, yes, take him to the gun range. This is going to take a while. I wouldn't mind. <clears throat> I could get a carriage. We can make it. We have one for shipping. We easily all could go. I would be happy to take you there. But if not, we can wait here. Um, it is cold out, and it is, like, snowing outside right now. But there is festivals in the city, and there are people hanging out, and there are uh, festivities to do. So you could stay or go, or you could just wait here and make sure this guy doesn't do anything. Voss is specifically interested now that he's trying to get him out of the shop. He's curious why. And also... Give me a perception check, want... Mr. Calicor. Mm-hmm. Ooh. Everson, you can see, too. You're more than welcome to make one. That's a 24. Okay. That's pretty good. 
No. So when he you handed him that and he said, "Oh, it was been cleaned with magic," his eyes behind that ginormous mustache lit up, and he did not make eye contact after that. Hmm. He's meticulously touching and cleaning and fixing things. Yeah, I'm gonna stay here. So what? You, like, what you, do uh, you can go, mate, if you want. But he unscrews the uh, metal or the wood engraved uh, bullet parlor plaque that's on the back. He unscrews it and takes it off and peeks underneath and puts it back down. Okay. Um, he's like, uh, 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 Angelo, can you sh can you close the shop for us then if they're going to be staying here? Please, please, please. If you do so. And he's like, I'm sure, Walters. They're, they're just shut the shop. We don't need any passerbyers coming in during this. This is a very important moment. Angelo goes, I apologize. And he goes downstairs and shuts the door and locks things up. He's like, if you need to leave, obviously you can let yourself out, but he doesn't want anyone else in here. He gets like this sometimes. You can see why our business is uh, not doing as well as it used to. Wanting. Yep. So about an hour and a half passes. Not a really long time. And he finally looks up from working on the gun that you brought in. And he goes, Mr. Calico, do you have any idea of, 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 of exactly what you have here right now? No. This is a I just know it's special piece. One of one. Nobody else has this. Anywhere. I never could. So he unscrews that plate off the back and sets it down. He's like, I did not add that plate. I don't know where the plate came from. We don't sell them that way. As you look at any of our stocks, uh, they are engraved on the back. Uh, no fakes. This is not a bullet puller gun. This is not one of the original Eisenheims from our production line. No, 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 no. This is the original Eisenheim from the mayor of the city back during the Ghoul Wars. So may I ask you where you got this? And he like sets a pistol on the bench, a revolver on the, on the bench between you and him pointing at Calcor. He is not touching it. He just sets it down on the roof. What's that for, mate? Just in case. You never know. People are um, quite crazy when they hear what I'm about to say. You I know, see. because I have to shoot you. Right, so you've just pulled a gun on me. No, no, no. I pulled it and put it on the bench. I'm not pointing at you. My hands are nothing. I couldn't get to this gun quicker than your magic. And, and Everson uh, is now focused. He's, he's been looking at everything in the room, just checking out all the gun stuff, and now he's just like Staring you know, at that guy. Staring at a guy, like, waiting. <laughs> so it's like an L shape, right? So if this is the L shape, Everston's, like, here. Voss is, like, over here. The guy is here. And then uh, uh, Angelo is outside the desk. Because he's been wandering around talking, cleaning the shop, like, trying to make it presentable. And he's like, no threat, no threat. Just personal safety. Oh, I see. It is loaded. I will tell you that now. And he and like picks it up, points it down, opens the cylinder, spins it so you can see it. Oh, there's a bunch. All six bullets are in there. Closes it, sets it back down. Beautiful pistol. Beautiful revolver. Engraved. Well done. Bullet parlor symbol on the handle. He sets it down, and it's pointed like this. It's not, you know, it's in your direction, but not directly at you. Where did you, where did you acquire this fine piece of uh, history? Off a dead body, I told you. And he hands the hands the plate to Angelo to look at. He goes, off a dead body. May I, may I ask where you found this dead body? Was it here in the city? Uh, Was it in a no. grave site? Nope. It sure? was attacking us on the ship that I was on. So I kicked it off the side. And, where, and then it where landed. Exactly, where exactly was that? If it was not here in Eisenheim. <clears throat> He's not like, go ahead and hand me back the rifle, mate. I'm not sure I... No, 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 no. I will not do that. This is a question that needs to be answered. You have my property that I brought in. This you're is holding the property of gun. a man buried here in Eisenheim. Our previous mayor. This is his rifle. 
there's the uh, distinct sound. It's it's quiet but distinct of an Thomas making a fist. <laughs> <laughs> the the. <laughs> The, the fingertips hit in the palm. <laughs> are you Justin. a four-finger to Thomas, or are you the Ninja Turtle three? <laughs> Man, I I don't know. Uh, what would a Voss have built? Voss, Actually, wasn't our Ninja Turtle three like this? Is that how we had drawn? Yeah, it? Well, it wasn't like that. no, it was like this. Like the thumb oh. was the equal size of right. of that. <laughs> um, I, I always thought uh, I always thought we've modeled them like the big finger and then two little ones. Yeah, maybe? that's what I thought it was. I thought it was like that. But yeah, maybe. I don't know. I don't That's know. That's up to you. I don't know how finely crafted you are. That's why I'm asking. Uh, well, Voss helped create me, so maybe... Oh, it's maybe Voss's top shape. So is he, is top he shape. Is he a four? <clears throat> yeah, he probably would be a four finger. All right. So he goes, uh... <clears throat> That's why you can manipulate, imp improvise weapons oh so well. With that said, mm -hmm. right. you, do you reach into your bag for one of the many improvised Everston's Ever Ready arsenals? <laughs> There's plenty around the shop here. Uh, maybe just throwing, throwing guns shop? like bullets. <laughs> Hold on, I gotta roll. I've never roll. used guns before to well, for shooting. Oh. Just okay. Okay, I roll, I roll, <laughs> Look out, he's got a gun. So here's here's the the ever ready arsenal, the era. Um, there is a cleaning rod for a large elephant gun. There is a bag of um, bearings and then in your bag that you have on you you know that on the Lyrist uh, you had picked up a head of a morning star oh a spiked neck. I'm, I'm gonna go for the bearings because I don't want anything like extra lethal I just want I'm just Something gonna bean bag a fucking sack. with a shot yeah, bag. It's just a yeah, just fucking sack exactly. a ball of bearings. Okay, bag of bearings, so sure. pick up the bag of bearings. It's it'll it'll have the same damage as the sap. Uh, as you like, reach down and hear the <laughs> of all the bearings kind of slide off the off the ledge and down next to him. Uh, and I'll, and <laughs> I'll follow Voss's lead because I don't want to just okay. start a ruckus. Angela goes. So Walter, after Walter, <laughs> call call down Walter. These men came to us. He's like, this is stolen from the mayor. You can't steal from a man's grave. We barely, barely, we don't even bury people anymore. I need to know what. Yeah, there's probably a reason where, for that, mate. And where you got it from, where? Where were you? We were, so as he's saying that, and he's saying that it's the mayor's, and I'm thinking back to about what happened here years ago. Society. Talked. Sure it was. Yes. Seven. So eleven. Do you want to spend? Could be important. Do you want to spend hero point? Yeah. Yeah, I'll spend one. Is that a roll I could make too, or we? Absolutely. Absolutely. Nine, there we go. I know even less. Nine. Uh, rolled a fifteen, so a nineteen. Society. You do remember this place was attached to the attack during the Ghoul Wars. You know they've had <laughs> numerous attacks here over the years. They're, the mayor well, did die here a few years ago. Okay. It's mainly thinking about the interaction with the cult that they had here of Aserac. Yep. <clears throat> now, with that said, with that said, um, and this unfitting music that I'm going to change. Mm -hmm. I don't know why we... Yeah, we Gunfight. Synth pop. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so... <laughs> Todd, uh, Everston hears that voice perk up. Oh, shit. Forgot about him for a minute. Yeah, I know. I wait. And he goes, uh, <laughs> hey, um, I know you're not a person who steals things. It's not your thing, right? You don't take things that don't belong to you. But, uh, I know a lot about what they're talking about. See, remember back in the past, I left for a while. I came here to Eisenheim. And uh, I may or may not know why that gun could end up in Merrifield. 
If you give me a moment to speak through you, I could explain it. Maybe calm the situation. All right. Give it. You're gonna let him. Oh. All right. So a voice perks up out of Everston. It does have the tone that he has, but the words don't sound like Everston. Boss, you know immediately it's not. There's no role required. It does not seem right. And he goes, "Do hey, I, Walter? Walter, Walter, Walter." And it has that resonance in it. Uh, actually, Todd, do you have any? Uh, do you want to speak through your thing? This guy is a smooth talker. Um, and he is definitely more on the master side of bluff and diplomacy and training. Uh, uh, but he would definitely want to calm the situation. And then I'll explain why. Do you, got, do you know whatever, what, what you would have this guy say? Because you can do it through your vocal filter then. Because I don't have that set up over here. <laughs> Walter, 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 listen, my friend. We've come a long way. And we do really hope that you would be cooperative and also aware that you are within reach of a very powerful device. Me. Oh, are you using it? <laughs> okay. He goes, uh, the, Walter looks at Voss and then realizes the threat in the room is not the caster. <laughs> um, you you know that this gun is very important as whatever the voice is that's speaking through you. Voss, this is a moment that is the first time I think you've actually heard this guy speak. You knew there was an issue. You know mm -hmm. that there's something up with what's going on at Everston. There has been zero time that has been looked into even though downtime has been there i know yep. the players have just had too much going on well no, he's thought of it but he didn't want to like it's as much our fuck up in his eyes as anything else so it's just mm -hmm. like just, just brush it under that rug. Out. just kind of see what you know is anyone else around yeah keep, we're keep gonna it under the apron yeah <laughs> So, Walter... Stay away um, from the landmine. It won't go off. Don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah, don't worry about yeah, it. Yeah, just don't uh, step on it. Don't step in the like Rambo of... when they're doing landmine, uh, landfield uh, races, landmine field races. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yikes. Uh, so he, uh, Walter goes, I, 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 um, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Everston. It's just that um, I was very close to the mayor of Eisenheim. Uh, him and I were, were I mean, this... This city is named after his family. The lineage is deep, right? Um, and, and we were... We were given the blueprints to the Eisenheim to mass produce them. Because the mayor was not going to produce this gun at a grand level. We helped make sure the Ghoul War ended. So when I look at this and say, it is personal to me, Mr. Calcor. It is deeply personal. So when I ask you, um, where did you get this? It's simply out of the fact that that man has been dead and buried. Voss kind of, with in the back of his head, knowing that the voice from Everson is different, and now he's heard it, so he can like investigate on that further. But that's not what's it's that's not what's happening at hand. Um, he's like, look, mate, I'll get it. That's what you had to say. I get that it's personal. I know that a couple years ago, you guys had to deal with a cult. Yes. In the city. Yes, like that true. was that was a big thing from Aserac, right? Does that name ring a bell? Uh, Angelo will go, uh, yes. Uh, yeah, yes, we did have an issue with the, the cult uh, of Aserac here. Uh, it has been cleansed, though. Uh, unfortunately, after an explosion and a good portion of the city being decimated by a ginormous skeleton. But yes, we did have that issue. Um... <clears throat> right, so... I don't think that it was actually completely dealt with because I got this gun off of a four-armed silver skeleton that attacked us on our ship that I knocked off the side and sent plummeting about 70 feet. So that's where I got this. 
They it both look at attack. each other. I at the same time. I rolled matching numbers. They both look at each other at the same time and go. Oh shit. <laughs> Walter goes, I apologize for my hostilities. I uh, are you coming from um and he pulls back uh his his lapel and he's got the order of gold symbol. Oh. And he goes, Got Terry, it. are you the new group that was sent uh, to the To Merrifield, yeah. I, d deepest apologies. I, I saw the, the, the Emerald Order and immediately thought that you had fucked something up. No, no, no. That's Crimson Vile, mate. That's not me. No. <laughs> I, I, I just mean that in the, in the fact that this gun is spiritually charged. I didn't know if you had done that or if it was that way uh, previously. Oh, no, I haven't. I haven't done anything to it, mate. I brought it here to, to try and fix it. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, I'm assuming you looked it over. You tried to see if there's anything, if it was a reliquary. And, and I'm here to tell you that it is actually holding or housing a reliquary inside. Is that what's under the plate? No, it is not into the... Um, hold on. And he, like, takes the, the pump, and he slides it all the way forward, and he pulls a pin out, slides it back, and takes the pump off. Inside the pump, there are four pieces of, like, like gem embedded in the bottom of it, like, deep. You know, there's sets so they don't scrape when you pump. Um, yeah. He says, this is... <clears throat> when we buried... The mayor. We buried himself, him, his wife, and his two children. When I say this is lineage, I mean it's lineage. And inside you can see the faces of the four in the gem. Each one of them being one of the family members. The story goes they're kept separate because together... Issues arise when the family was put in a reliquary together. And now you would know you can fetter a family to one reliquary, but you have mm -hmm. to have a lot of money, and it is a new thing. Like in the last, like, 12 months. They tried doing this, say, 8 to 10 years ago. Shit wouldn't probably wouldn't have went well. Yeah. So they had to be separated, and they longed for each other, so we at least put them near each other. We, we, we believe when this was fettered that, that they can speak. We just don't know that. Obviously, times have changed. The gun has been uh, buried in the uh, mausoleum with the rest of their belongings of, of value um, as, a, as for the rest of the family members to come see them. Pictures, paintings, things like that. Personal property uh, that didn't get passed on. So you have something that isn't yours um, but now that I know why it is there I must ask you um, is the cult dealt with and Angelo's going around and packing up like a, a, a box and he's putting things in a box right now from shelves Mike no mate it's not we're still working on it in fact it's uh, it's quite in process um Without going into too much detail, uh, there's a lot of problems. We've made some headway in that town, but there's still a lot of problems to fix. We haven't even started on the railway. We're still trying to build the place up so that we can get it functioning to be able to receive people. I see, I see. There's, there's still a lot of work to be done. I was hoping to have this shotgun as an, another asset, um, just it as I couldn't asset. forward myself. It is the best asset. <laughs> it is the original one of one Eisenheim made by the mayor himself. It is the prototype that he continued to master until we can make the blueprint for mass production. You have I mean, the first. Mate, this, like, the process of putting a whole family together, you can do it now. But, like, if you tried this a decade ago, it just wouldn't have worked. We did. But you we can separated. do it now. We can do it now. And he flips right. the flips the, the shotgun over in the back where it has the the symbol for the Eisenheim family, the, their mark. Uh, there's a mm -hmm. spot for a gem there that has been pried, since then pried out. 
We did fetter them together. Uh, and unfortunately, it ended pretty poorly. So we refettered them in no, a no, lump, no. and we did them separately, because this was quite some time ago. Right, I'm saying it could probably be done now. If they miss each other, and I, I'll get that. I'm, I know how fine family is. I'm saying it might be something we could do. And we... And then... Uh, the, uh, Angela comes over and sets a second crate on the counter between you two. Uh, and it says shipping. And another one says shipping. And he writes out paperwork. And it says Merrifield, Merrifield, uh, property of Walter, property of Angelo. And he sticks the emblems on there. And uh, Angelo looks up and he's now got a jacket on. And he hands Walter a winter jacket. And you see him turn the sign to closed. And he writes a note that says, till further notice. We are coming with you. Kind of look back at Everston. And uh, there's the sound of a bag of ball bearings being set back down. <laughs> Shunk. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, uh, what are you hoping to accomplish, mate? Obviously, stop in the cult of Asarak. Unless you're an inquisitor, I'm not sure that that's going to be viable. There's there's a lot going on there. It's um. You're correct. I am not an inquisitor. I am a master of smithery. But uh, my friend here, he he is important. And the guy looks up, and he puts down like a backpack, and he and. Uh, Angela goes, um, I am not an inquisitor. I, I, I walked away. Um, but, and he slides out a gold mask and sets it on the counter. Says, I was once a retinue to the Briars. To the Briars? Aren't you supposed to hand those in? You are. I like this guy. All right. Right? You are. And I did not. And I, unlike many, uh, remember everything. Mm -hmm. He slides it back in. He says, so, we are going with you. And his accent goes from one of being an Eisenhower to sounding of one from Moldavia. And he says, I do track people who come. People who've come through here. And I know there is Inquisitor in your city. I do not trust him or who he is. There are many people who say he is a false item. You're saying there's an Inquisitor in Merrifield already? Yes, I do. So with that, I'm going to end today's stream. For those who don't know, the Inquisitor car got played last Friday. We now have an Inquisitor of Flame in the city. Angelo here being a retinue member. Retinue are the people who work alongside the Inquisitors of Flame, who hunt down cultists uh, and burn people who worship keepers down to the ground. The retinue are there to keep them sane, while the retinue themselves remember everything when the mask is wear worn, when they take it off. Those memories are pulled away with the mask. Usually there's one sorcerer and someone of clergy. Walter and Angelo are asking to come along, and I guess the last question I have for Everston and Voss as we close this up for the night when they say, we are coming with you. Do you say yes or no? Absolutely. If you want to make a roll, you're welcome to make a roll, any of that kind of stuff. But as we're wrapping up Side Quest Episode 6, uh, I think I'm lovingly going to call this one Click Boom. But... <laughs> <laughs> um, Voss says, uh, all right, we leave in two days. No, we leave today. You have a ship? No. 
I don't need a ship. I mean... Long walk. He pulls yeah, back a rug walk. that has a teleportation circle on it. Oh! I'm sorry, what is that? I can get us near Merrifield. Within a day's walk. Shall we? And he sets the two bricks down in the center of the teleportation circle. <laughs> they grab a bunch of firearms off the wall and set it in there. They clean a section of their shop to bring with them. Teleportation magic is extremely controlled. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, it, well, it's controlled by the church specifically. Mm -hmm. This is. He's ex church. Yeah, ex is the key word there. <laughs> also, he kept his mask. Dude, this is. Oh, man. Voss is like Voss is the partier, but like. Shall we? This is. Are you with us or not? <laughs> kind of look at Everston. Like, I mean, can he fit on that? I don't care about this shop. Just walk through the wall. Just don't damage the circle. <laughs> Crawl up here. Right. All right. This, All right. Pl <clears throat> this place has been worthless for over three years since the man across the street. So, master. <clears throat> we go. Uh, Voss will step in, and he is going to open whatever arcane sense he can to see what this magic is when it happens. Uh, just give me a knowledge arcana, and I will explain. I, you know, here's our closing scene. I will explain the teleportation. Just Everston's like hunched over everybody. There's a peak, so you know you're just kind of ducking it. under the beams, but you could stand <laughs> right. between them here. I'm gonna use my last hero point. All right. Everson, you want to give me a perception check on for a sense motive on these guys as we're closing out? Natural 20. Okay. I'll explain extra stuff as we go through. Um, I got to do that for this. That's a 20 arcana as well. Not a nat, okay. dirty 20. All right. So let's grab the right music for this. the brave from Arcane Anthem. As he as you come into the circle, he grabs the mask and puts the mask on. You see that of fire seal it to his face. The eyes light up orange under a mask, and you can see him under it, and the, the light fades. Uh, in Moldavian, he starts speaking an incantation for teleportation. You know that the, the prefix uh, on it is attaching it to the circle you're at. And the call that he's doing is attaching it to a burnt keeper temple outside of the town of Merrifield. You know roughly where he's doing it. Uh, is it, and the flames appear around the circle. And uh, Walter looks over, he's like, I never liked this part, ever. He's like, it is quite painful as the fire ignites. Wait, what? <laughs> uh, as a fire ignites, you feel warmth. It hurts. It is painful. It's discomforting. It's it's that constant moment between putting your hand on the stove of being burned and the sensation of being burned. But you come through unscathed, standing in a blackened husk of a building. The fires die down. The ash settles over top of the seal. Everston, you notice, and the other person that is with you notices, uh, as the mask lights up and his hands light up, um, behind him, there is a second image of uh, Angelo, but big, armored. Uh, he is carrying um, a shield, a tower shield, uh, and he is carrying a bastard sword, uh, like a fiery <laughs> image of him that when you land here disappears you don't see that boss and the spirit inside you goes oh he's one of them and i'm gonna end the stream there thank you everybody for 
watching this. Uh, this will you're watching this will be airing on Tuesday. We're super excited for our sponsors, especially our new one, Beetle and Grim. If you are playing Pathfinder and you are like, I know, I know for sure, Drew, Todd maybe as well. I've wanted a character journal that just has the rules of the class in the damn thing. It's finally happening on their Kickstarter. They're doing their character chronicles. It ends December 1st in the wee wee hours. So do it at the last day of this month at the very latest. Get yourself a character chronicle. They're $35. You can upgrade for $25 more and get a PDF form fillable that will last you forever. And I believe these character sheets are made for your forever characters, these journals. If you're playing an AP or you have a long running campaign, this is for you. Rules for your class are in it. If it's a wizard, it's all of your spells. We have four classes to start. Fighter, Cleric, Wizard, and Rogue. And if they hit the 90,000 and the 140,000, two more classes are coming out as well. Thank you to Norse Foundry for providing the beautiful dice that I am using today and something special soon from them. And then we didn't do our blue tile maps today, but Jason Bullman's blue tile maps are outstanding. If you are a GM and looking for a way to <laughs> slap together a dungeon or a city in a matter of moments... His former time as an architect uh, definitely shows. Voss, you got any parting words? I know you got some sponsors. Um, well, just uh, uh, thank you. Uh, coming off of that, um, if you do want dice, go to Norse Foundry. If you use the promo code Athontia, you'll get 15% off um, of your order uh, for uh, links below for the dice. Um, and me, if you, <laughs> I was combing earlier and you saw Eric has a beard. Todd has a great goatee. If you are um, not shaving for this month or just have a beard in general, um, go to the Beard Struggle. Uh, if you use the code STRENGTH24 at your checkout, that'll save you 15% off of that order as well. Uh, the here to be heated beard comb is awesome. Eric's is a little whack right now, so he's going to get a new one. Um, but uh, they're great. <laughs> Their oils are great. My beard has never been softer. I've got the day and night oil system that they use. It's fucking dope. Um, so check them out. And... Uh, yeah, follow the stream. Uh, 100 uh, followers. 100 followers on Twitch, and we will be doing the beginning of the map of Merrifield. But also, until the end of the night on Tuesday, Todd here, one of our resident artists, did all of our character work, and we have the Everston sticker up to the end of Tuesday night. Uh, normally, it would yeah. be one day merch drop, but because of some issues with the store, we're leaving it up through the evening all the way to Tuesday. So get that while you can. The following Tuesday, one of the new stickers and a new shirt is coming out. So thank you, everybody, for watching. This has been an amazing six episodes. We're halfway through the season, and OBS Ninja still believes Drew's camera doesn't work. So <laughs> my all sparkly again. You're all sparkly. <laughs> my like a Twilight vampire. Yep. So that's it for us. Thank you for watching, everybody. And uh, I'm excited to see you for episode seven, where we finally go in to the Cave of the Gorgon. Bye, everybody. Hey, everybody, look up. Thank you for watching SideQuest episode five. If you enjoyed, don't forget to like, subscribe, and share with your friends. The thousand, we give away dice.